Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, lecture presentation uh, from Columbia GSAP. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and we're looking forward to uh, an exciting and inspiring presentation tonight. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to do uh, an acknowledgement. Uh, tonight, we gather in Lenape Hoking, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their traditional territory, elders, ancestors, and future generations, and, and in acknowledging as a school that Columbia, like New York City and the United States as a nation, was founded upon the exclusion and erasures of many indigenous peoples. GSAP is committed to addressing the deep history of erasure of indigenous knowledge in, in the professions of the built environment generally and in the Western tradition of architectural education specifically. With this, GSAP commits to confronting these institutional legacies as agents of colonialism and to honoring indigenous knowledge in its curriculum. Tonight, it is my uh, pleasure to welcome Olale Kong Jaifus to Columbia GSAP. Lake, as he is affectionately called, is a visionary full stop, without any conditions, uh, nor any reservations. Uh, and I should probably just stop there. No other superlatives are needed. Uh, and I could say that that is all the introduction that this audience needs to hear. However, because I am a bit of a fanboy about Lake's work, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Lake. Uh, Lake is a Brooklyn-born artist, uh, a Brooklyn-based artist, uh, born in Nigeria, uh, trained as an architect with a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Cornell University, whose work reimagines social spaces that examine the relationships between architecture, community, and the environment. Additionally, his work confronts social issues through an installations, large-scale murals, large-scale public works, 3D computer models that reflect ideas and about the future, and let's say, uh, not so future architectural imaginaries. Lake's work challenges us to consider relationships between art, politics, popular culture, and the cultural Im imaginary as these relationships inform urban spaces. Uh, Lake's uh, list of exhibits is quite long. I'll just give you, uh, give you a few. Uh, his work has been included in the seventh a Athens Biennale uh, in Athens, Greece, the Rhizomes uh, exhibition uh, at Le Bas Sous Marine in uh, Bordeaux, France, uh, uh, as part of the Mothership Voyage to Afrofuturism at the Oakland Museum in Oakland, California. Uh, his work was shown at the 2021 Venice Architecture uh, Biennale, uh, the Reconstructions Architecture and Blackness Exhibition, uh, Architecture and Blackness in America Exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 2021, and the African Mobilities at the Architecture Museum de Te um, München in Munich, Germany, just to name a few. Uh, Lake is also the recipient of a number of fellowships, uh, including being named as a 2021 United States Artist Fellow, uh, a fellow of the New York Foundation for the Arts in, uh, in 2020, a Bellagio Center Fellow from the Rockefeller Foundation in 2019, um, a McDowell Colony Fellow, a McDowell Fellow, I should say, um, uh, as well as the recipient of a New York uh, Public Design Commission Award for Excellence in Design uh, in 2020, as well as the prestigious uh, Emerging Voices Award from the Architectural League, uh, also in 2020. Uh, his academic uh, resume includes uh, a visiting lecturer at Cornell University and visiting professor at Yale University. Uh, School of Architecture. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that Lake is also a co-conspirator and founding member of the Black Reconstruction Collective. So there you have it. Uh, a little bit uh, about Lake in terms of his bio and his CV, um, but I am sure that, uh, that my introduction fails to compare with uh, what we are going to, to see from Lake tonight. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Lake Joyfus. And I'll turn it over <laughs> to you, Lake. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mario, for that uh, dazzling introduction. I really appreciate it. And of course, uh, to GSAP for inviting me to discuss my work this evening and everyone um, who, is in who is in attendance today. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as, as Mario mentioned, my kind of work spans from large scale public installation um, to, you know, more visual exhibit work um, in which I really deploy a kind of sci fi Afrofuturist, Afro surrealist um, lens in, in creating these architectural utopias or protopias or, or, or heterotopias. Um, as a means to examine a variety of contemporary uh, geopolitical, uh, mythocultural, um, economic, environmental realities. And so um, in that vein, I'm going to take you through um, several of these uh, works and, and kind of discuss both my conceptual um, process, um, you know, and, and, and how I really develop and think through these particular projects, um, as well as the kind of the trajectory of, of these types of works. Um, so I hope everyone can see the screen. And so here I have again the title Architectural Utopian Dystopianisms, Afro Surrealist Co Atemporal Fictions. Um, a lot of my work is often referred to as Afrofuturist. I'm fine with that designation. I think it is serviceable as kind of an entree into the sort of work that I produce. But I'm, you know, I, I very much think through, you know, a, a lot of these speculative projects as, you know, existing um, in the now, but in an alternative uh, or alternate reality or parallel kind of world space, um, you know, different potentialities to occur at, at different points um, throughout time. And so I'll start with this first project of mine that was exhibited at the um, kitchen as well as the new museum. Um, the kitchen in 2008, new museum is part of the last newspaper exhibit in 2011. And this was kind of very early in my artistic career where I was still drawing heavily on my practice um, and, and uh, primarily educational experience uh, being trained as an architect, kind of treating the work that I produce almost like, um, you know, self-initiated studio projects. And so this uh, project was called the Adverse Speak and the PPPP, the Public-Private Partnership uh, Program. And it was a collaboration between uh, uh, myself and, and a good friend and colleague of mine, Matthew Vaz. Um, and, and so, there were certain things I was fascinated with about this particular um, project. Uh, were, and, and, and several of them are kind of um, blurring the lines between public private space uh, and platforms, uh, societal obsession with quantification um, and abiding faith and kind of technical sophistication uh, and, and our uh, burgeoning and increasing tendency towards the commodification and um, financialization of, of all aspects of life. And so this was how the work was presented at the kitchen. It was a series of these archival prints. Um, and the first was the gap map. And so I, I like to show this work, particularly because I'm you know deploying this kind of very digitized eight bit, uh, aesthetic and and um, in terms of kind of the work that I produce, uh, you know, the visual language um, and the visual narratives that I, I present, um, I try and be very thoughtful about how well they align with the objectives and the inquiries being presented in this work. And so a project like this um, looks at uh, PPP, the Public Private Partnership Program in, in this kind of world is the governing structure. Um, and it's kind of, it's this borderless political entity uh, that thrives and expands based on its ability to issue legal tender. So in this world, um, you know, much of the kind of global legal tender is beginning to lose value. And so this corporation is buying it up and developing this system uh, called adverse speak, which is the environment, which is the economic socioeconomic framework. 
And so adverse speak is this proprietary language developed by the public private partnership program um, in which it basically pays participants to um, uh, substitute brands for nouns, verbs, and adjectives in kind of everyday conversation. And so the result of that is sort of uh, an idea about exploring linguistic segregation, um, uh, uh, like a total surveillance state, uh, because in order to kind of accrue uh, a wage or wealth, one has to be pretty much surveilled constantly, right? For how well they're speaking up brands in everyday conversation. Um, and then of course, the commodification of basic human interactions. And so this is the greater area protocol map. Um, also it's the gap map. So it's sponsored by gap. So a lot of this project is playing with, you know, an incredible amount of detail, both in the imagery and in the naming and in the language of, of how, you know, each of these images are, are named and in the kind of organization of, as you see a lot of information and notes around, um, you know, how this world operates. And basically what happens in this world is that individuals um, apply to live in this area, the, the, the greater area protocol, um, but they have to take uh, this residency applicant test. And it's a very kind of short test. And depending on how well they're able to um, perform in kind of eliciting positive responses to all of the different brands that have bought into this world, determines their ranking from um, RSR 03 and 04, which are the higher end, which also determine where one can live. So they live in kind of the higher uh, high rises in the city center and these kind of luxury um, developments. And then um, the lower ranking RSR 0 and RSR 01 live in kind of the lower uh, left-hand quadrants of these kind of internment camps and work effectively as day laborers um, within this sort of city. Um, so here's a kind of zoom in of, of how this map is laid out, um, you know, and how it kind of works between uh, this settlements on the perimeter and as well as moving into the uh, city center. Um, and again, you can see sort of uh, these different close-ups again and so, you know, really thinking through this digitized 8-bit uh, uh, felt appropriate because so much information is being conveyed in these images, very few images that are presented in this wall space. And so, you know, this greater area protocol map has keywords and a legend and descriptions of kind of how different things work. So, you know, everyone is outfitted with a Bluetooth, everyone who's a participant or resident is outfitted with this Bluetooth and all their information is recorded in these Hive data silos and Hive stands for human interaction and verbal exchanges. Um, and so again, this, this, this kind of, these recordings are thoroughly vetted and, you know, and, and analyzed for positive responses to speaking up brands. And of course, part of uh, the surveillance, total surveillance of this world is, head, is, is helmed by the uh, sector surveillance service at central and synaptic site. So again, these incredibly bureaucratic, alliterative terms were very much part of, you know, the, this kind of visual presentation and language. So as it says, camaraderie and other forms of human relationships are registered with the sector surveillance service. All human interactions and verbal exchanges are recorded and evaluate, evaluated in order to assess the adverse speak accumulation quotient. Accompanying that large greater area protocol map is the 4P charter, which is on the right, and the 4P mandala, which is on the left. And so the mandala um, is basically the kind of avatar for the credits or the cryptocurrency that uh, residents and participations in this program would accrue. And the charter is basically a very comprehensive breakdown of what everything in this mandala refers to and means, um, the countries, the regions that are participants in this. Um, and you know, we, we, we also playing off the dollar bill with its e pluribus unum, you know, wanted to come up with a kind of ominous um, Latin phrase as well. So it's imperium sign fine or sin fine. I'm not sure the uh, pronunciation, but basically it's kind of, uh, it means an empire without end. So this is sort of this kind of 
new world, of, again, of total surveillance of everything you say, everything you do, how you move is being, mod is being monitored and um, is being financialized, right? Um, and so then including those first two, you know, those first several images was, are, are these, which are now these eight and a half, and, eight and a half by 11 prints, which are um, tear sheets from the Adverse Speak and Public-Private Partnership um, handbook, pretty much breaking down how this world sort of works. And again, very fascinated with, you know, this intense bureaucratic language, this, you know, verbose uh, um, alliteration. So this is the construct to calculate the quantifiable quality of adverse speak quotient, otherwise known as the T, uh, sorry, the 2C3Q. And um, you have these for each of the brands that you're responsible for promoting. And so it's broken down to, you know, negative, positive responses for nouns, verbs, adverbs, additives, um, and the kind of um, sort of responses one is able to elicit. So this would be in, in someone's kind of, um, uh, you know, year end dossier for review. And so on the right is the aptitude test you would take the 5AC3, which is the average applicant aptitude for adverse, for adverse speak advocate candidacy. Um, and so it's just a kind of simple tree, uh, a simple tree sort of, um, you know, test, but where you end up in the end determines your particular ranking. Um, and then the 6AQ to the um, left is the appended algorithm for the average annual adverse speaks uh, accumulation. And so, you know, that was kind of my first exercise in this sort of world building. Um, and again, you know, being so close to, um, you know, this is kind of very early in my career of, of being a sort of visual artist and, and uh, again, relying heavily on this kind of architectural background, um, you know, on the conventions of architecture, um, uh, drawing and, and language uh, to really present this project. Uh, moving on from there, New Lagos, uh, is a collaboration that I did with another friend and colleague, Wale Oyejide, um, who uh, runs this menswear line uh, called Ikere Jones. Um, and so for the launch of his um, brand, a series of kind of these bespoke uh, Western tailored, but West African prints, um, uh, you know, suits and, and menswear and, and, you know, scarves and such, uh, he basically wanted me to create a series of these illustrations that blended, um, you know, my kind of sci-fi reimagining with uh, the kind of everyday, um, you know, uh, in, in, in environment of Lagos, particularly the, you know, market, market spaces. Um, so I did a series of these four images and I'm now pivoting away from the kind of very detailed note-taking, heavy information um, just to present these actual scenes. And, and these works really, um, they catapulted kind of both of our careers. And I think it's because it, it was the first time, you know, I, I think people had seen a juxtaposition uh, between a kind of sci-fi aesthetic and sensibility with a sort of non-Western, um, you know, heavily, you know, heavily grounded in, 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 in cultural imagery. Um, uh, and, and this wasn't something that, you know, was done for an exhibit or any particular venue. Again, this was a launch of his menswear line and it wasn't even promoted through any other means. And at the time he simply posted it to his Tumblr page and it, became incredibly popular. And I mean, for the, this was around 2013, I believe. And so for the next literally, you know, um, eight years, this work just resonated and, and gathered an enormous amount of attention. Um, and, and so again, we hadn't given much thought to how this could be perceived as radical, um, but apparently it was. Apparently there just wasn't that kind of uh, challenge, I guess, to this sort of very sanitized, 
homogenized um, Western aesthetic of science fiction visuals and also what could be considered advanced, right? Much of science fiction imagery, you know, relies on kind of these slick steel and glass and, you know, these large constructs. Um, and again, very homogenous, not, not, not so much rooted in kind of um, the culture uh, of, of, of place. And so I think that's why these works really resonated. Um, and so, you know, the kind of breakdown, this is the first time I was really playing around with photo montage. And so I start with uh, um, images that are sourced um, from, from the web or taken by myself and friends and work with a series of kind of layering of, of, of these um, different photographs that I take. And so you're looking here at the third mainland bridge um, in Lagos, Nigeria, which connects, um, you know, uh, the mainland uh, to Lagos Island. And then these are a series of photographs I had taken um, in the Makoko fishing village, right? So I'm finding the horizon line and then I'm kind of layering up these images. So this was kind of a, a very new aesthetic for me and, and, and the kind of work that I was producing. And so you see a little bit of color correcting and you know centering the horizon, um, adding in backdrops, more detail, more information. Interestingly enough, these photographs that you see here were taken um, by my mother in Ibadan in 1976. Um, so these are different photographs she'd taken of, you know, these barber shops, uh, tailors and, and the signage. Um, and then here I'm incorporating now the 3D uh, model of these, you know, now futuristic infrastructures um, that are beginning to populate this scene. Um, putting in this kind of foregrounded catwalk and then adding in um, Wale Oyejide with a sort of blend um, with the hyena men. Um, I can't remember, if, you know, like the photographer, but again, heavily on this kind of digital collaging, uh, photo montaging of images, and then putting this textured layer over it and then building up the shadows and the details and kind of, again, playing with the color to really give it this more like comic book, um, illustrative look. And so, and then of course, adding in, you know, more of that particular detail. And again, these works were, I mean, just how much they resonated with, I guess, a sort of uh, aesthetic that people had not really seen. Um, and so that led me into a project that's probably one of my longest ongoing projects. It started back in 2015. It's called Shanty Megastructures for Lagos, Nigeria. Um, interestingly enough, because of the popularity of those new Lagos images that I had collaborated on with uh, Wale, I, you know, I, I just kept getting so much, um, you know, uh, so many people and individuals and venues reaching out specifically about that work. Um, and that I wanted to create something um, kind of with a kind of more intention and kind of more of a conceptual narrative and analysis um, that deployed again that blend of the informal kind of language of, um, you know, the markets and the settlements, uh, the, you know, urban settlements of Lagos, Nigeria, um, with this sort of sci-fi language and aesthetic. And so Shanty Megastructures was born out of that. And so looking at Lagos, which is a city of like now around 30 million inhabitants, but it's expected to grow rapidly um, in kind of uh, population over the next 10 years, um, quadrupling, tripling. Um, and so it's, it's a very fascinating place for these kind of explorations and kind of looking at the urban context and looking at development. And so that's what this project became about for me was looking at the blend between large scale urban developments and the kind of improvised housing settlements that exist in the interstices and the, you know, um, outer peripheral spaces of Lagos, Nigeria, but also a kind of critique of the large scale development that takes place, not only in Lagos, but throughout the world, right, that, that kind of um, advantages and privileges, uh, you're, you're more, you know, middle, upper class, luxury class, right? Um, and, and at worst, 
ignores um, communities like Makoko on, on the right and, and um, sorry, at best ignores communities like Makoko on the right and at worst, you know, completely destroys, displaces, bulldozes um, these communities. And I like to show these images of Ida B. Wells um, uh, homes in Chicago, um, Illinois, simply because this isn't something that's specific to Lagos. It happens all over the world. You know, the kind of um, eminent domain and the reclamation of neighborhoods and the destruction of, you know, these, these, these project homes that house so many people and then the rebuilding of these kind of luxury um, developments, sometimes mixed use, sometimes ostensibly there is room made for um, below market rates, uh, renters or um, the right of first refusal for the communities that, that, that live there um, before being displaced. But we know that often doesn't work out at all um, in favor for anyone who had been a long time resident. So again, that kind of juxtaposition of these two aspects of Lagos, Nigeria is kind of very high end rent seeking, you know, massive developments, venture capitalist investments um, with the, uh, this kind of very essential market um, uh, culture that, that really drives much of the society. And so in a sense, it, became, it started this sort of sky rise project um, that I centered right on the third mainland bridge, which is known for intense traffic, um, just, you know, kind of endemic of so many problems uh, that, you know, that the city faces with, with infrastructure and overpopulation. So I wanted to create these large developments um, and interweaving and interconnecting of, you know, public and private and park and green land space um, and fish farm and, you know, public transportation and, 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 and the like, um, they connected to, uh, you know, Makoko villages, which is located at, at the foot of um, kind of the entrance onto the third mainland bridge. And so I was interested at the outset um, in, you know, the kind of creative, um, sustainable practices, um, you know, exhibited and, 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 and demonstrated by a lot of these um, slum settlements, which are actually, you know, highly self-organized and, and really, you know, perform a lot of these sustainable practices, both as a function of necessity, um, as well as ingenuity. And I wanted to kind of project that into this really massive scale um, uh, you know, constructs that, 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 you know, built in the image of, in the language, in the building typology uh, and material language of these um, communities. Um, but I got invited to participate in the 2015 uh, Shenzhen Biennial. And so it, it, I decided, you know, to kind of pair away, you know, all of the detail and the note taking and the breakdown and the kind of architectural presentation, um, as you saw in projects like Adverse Speak. And it became much more about um, just these very simple photo montages showing this reimagined settlement at the scale of large scale, um, you know, of, of, at scale of colossal urban developments placed into these areas of privileged, luxury real estate throughout Nigeria. And so these were, you know, seven foot by five foot, um, you know, mounted panels that were just these kind of images that gave you a sense of um, the sort of language and, 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 and the community and the lived spaces um, and the architecture of this world. And again, you know, it's called, you know, Afrofuturist. And I know when um, Black Panther came out, there's that scene where a kind of plane or shuttle is descending into Black Panther. I got a bunch of like emails and calls like, oh, you know, did you have anything to do with the design of, you know, of, of Wakanda? Uh, so it was, it was interesting. But um, again, I think just the, the, the lack of imagery like this, the lack of Really, really kind of challenging the Western notion of science fiction, technological advancement, what it looks like, what it means, the communities that it services um, that are part of, 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 you know, this world. And so, you know, similar to the new Lagos images, these were very compelling as, as, as well, right? As, um, 
you know, for so many of the reasons that I, you know, just mentioned. Um, and so these scenes are, again, they're a blend of sight images um, that uh, my, myself have taken and a, and a friend and colleague had taken throughout Mozambique um, and, and uh, Johannesburg and, and Cape Town in South Africa, and then building them up with, you know, all of these different um, elements, people, uh, vegetation, line, you know, laundry lines of clothing, um, and then, you know, building in these um, photo, sorry, these computer models, these kind of digital models, and then really setting it into a scene um, that, that carries so much interesting narrative in and of itself, um, again, without relying on all the different note taking and such. And so, you know, I also created a series of these um, uh, 3D VR scapes, just so people could really get a sense of the scale of this world, right? Um, because just in the photo montage, these, these, these spaces are incredibly massive, right? And so I just just created these kind of still vantage points that showed, you know, what, what it looks like to kind of, you know, be located somewhere um, in this world in these particular scenes. Let's go forward to the next slide. And so I did, you know, about three, you know, three versions of these, um, again, placing individuals, you know, right there within the site. Um, and again, you know, this one shows how, you know, the sort of space frame and how this particular world builds up um, and really what it looks like to occupy uh, a particular point, um, you know, in this world. And so here uh, in this scene that's building up right now, you're basically on like one of those twisting, twisting, turning roads. Um, so you can kind of see all the different things that are happening, market spaces, uh, these, these kind of smaller farm areas. Sorry. Um, accompanying this as well, um, I created this, uh, <laughs> this short animation, right? This, this, uh, short video around two minutes long. And, and it was kind of a little bit of sort of guerrilla art architecture. Um, cause what I did is I found what would be the antithesis to this project, which is the eco Atlantic developments of Lagos, Nigeria, which is actually a development that's taking place. It's kind of massive luxury development. Um, and I found a series of you know, within their promotional video that I found on YouTube, um, I located, um, you know, a handful of these outtakes from like two seconds to five seconds to 10 seconds. I downloaded them and then photo montaged, you know, my uh, shanty mega structures into these scenes and then re-uploaded the videos um, back into YouTube using many of the keywords, uh, many of the search words so that when people would look um, up, you know, Eco Atlantic promotional video, they would see kind of my shanty megastructures um, alternative world as well. And so these are stary, uh, so these are a series of, um, you know, some of those stills. Um, so this is kind of, but I'll skip ahead just so you can just see a bit of what that looks like.
that gives you a kind of sense of that. Um, the next iteration of this project was part of this exhibit called African Mobilities. And so this is an exhibit um, that was curated by Dr. Uh, Mpo Matsipa, who I've also collaborated with on a further extension of this project. Um, and it was exhibited in Munich in 2017, and it had subsequent exhibits uh, in, in Lagos in 2019, along with the public screening um, and you know different viewings. And so basically the idea of uh, African mobility, as it says, was to explore and respond to the complexities of migration and circulation of people, ideas, resources, and aesthetics, both in physical space and spaces of the imagination. Um, and a kind of subtitle of this exhibit was, this is not another refugee exhibit. And so it was about really expanding beyond the typical um, type of work, both architectural and creative work that we often see um, when engaging with the continents uh, of Africa is oftentimes, excuse me, you know, very paternal, right? The idea of going uh, or has a kind of savior aspect to it of going to build a school or going to build a hospital um, you know, or some other sort of civic center that serves the people from either this kind of top down or bottom up um, strategy, but really getting creative and inventive and showing kind of other engagements with the continent. And so with this, I collaborated with another uh, Wale, Wale Lawal, who is uh, born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria. And I just told him, you know, what Shanty Megastructures was about. Um, and I gave them very loose parameters to develop uh, three narratives that I would then visualize and create these three experimental animations. And so part of our research and due diligence was, you know, hosting several workshops in Lagos, uh, presenting shanty megastructures, um, you know, touring um, places like Makoko Village uh, and Badagri and just learning more about the history. Uh, you can see that's myself uh, uh, and, and Wale on that lower right hand image. Um, in the 2019, we held a public view under Falomo Roundabout Bridge. Um, and so uh, in addition to screening the experimental animations, we also had, you know, uh, docents out there with these gear VR headsets so people could actually go inside the world and get a sense of it. Um, and so here's some more images of uh, the presentation in Lagos, Nigeria. And the public screening was completely open-ended. There wasn't even much press. It was just, I mean, this is a very busy um, intersection coming, you know, right off of the bridge. And so people just kept flooding in. It was kind of very exciting to see it presented in this very public way. And so there were three different animations I mentioned. The first is offline. Um, and it speculates around the sustainability of a completely digital world, um, but it's illegal to go offline. So we made this kind of back room area um, in the back of this computer um, electronics uh, store where you could kind of pay your credits, um, completely log off um, and go sit in these like repurposed airplane seats, don these masks, um, with your psychedelic drug of choice and kind of disappear into the ether. The other one was uh, Omi, uh, sorry, Ominira, which means freedom in Yoruba. Um, and it explores the property rights of, you know, kind of lo local Afri African mobilities to a legal fishing adventure of two scavengers. It was a father and a daughter um, who live. Um, so while they came up with this kind of further, uh, I guess, marginalized world, at the periphery of the shanty megastructures that um, use the sort of uh, shipping containers, of course, uh, for much of the kind of exports of, 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 of you know, um, Nigeria's oil production using these now repurposed shipping containers um, on these kind of multi-level stilts that have these variety of kind of green um, aquaponic, aeroponic farming and, and other sources um, of kind of this very sustainable community. And so again, here are some stills from that scene. And then the final one uh, is Dreamscape. And so Dreamscape imagines the last uh, seven minutes of a day laborer's life. And so in this world of Dreamscape, 
Um, day laborers work from uh, sun up to sundown and often beyond, and they live in these single residency occupancy units um, within the, the massive shanty megastructures, kind of hull shapes. Um, but they have very limited freedom. They simply work constantly and then return to these units. Um, and it's kind of this very dark exploration of both kind of being confined to this very limited space, but being able to travel beyond. Um, and, uh, you know, this euthanized version of overpopulation. So people draw, uh, um, you know, straws are in a particular lottery, which determines their lifespan. And that lifespan is set and they work until that point. So this is the last, again, seven minutes of this character named uh, Shikoni Gomez. Um, but I guess the reprieve they're granted within this space is that each unit is outfitted with this AI and the AI artificial intelligence system um, basically can create a dreamscape, a dream world, a kind of gateway into a paradise of your particular choosing. And so though you may work this kind of very backbreaking, um, you know, you know, performing this labor throughout the day, at night you could exist thousands of years in this kind of dreamscape. So this kind of goes through the scene. And again, the last, um, you know, five, seven minutes of this laborer's life. Um, and so I guess uh, I'm not sure we'll have time to show the video. So I will proceed to the next iteration of, um, the next iteration of, of Shanty Megastructures is now the Anarchonauts. And so where Shanty Megastructures was fascinated with the architecture of this world, with the kind of extending visibility um, to these marginalized communities, to, to, to presenting them in the future, saying that they exist um, not only as, as participants, but contributors you know, to this uh, futuristic world. Uh, the Anarchonauts is now moving into the interior of these spaces um, where I'm looking at what these characters and individuals might look like. And so this is like a post-capitalist, post-industrial world, of course, of kind of severe resource scarcity of, you know, deep climate crisis, um, but the sort of resilience of the individuals within these communities to repurpose and upcycle and readapt the kind of digital e-waste, uh, digital detritus, electronic e-waste um, of, of you know, all of these kind of elements that are, that are sort of left behind, right? Um, there's sort of a, a massive e-waste uh, issue, you know, that we have, which, uh, uh, you know, reflects sort of um, uh, the sort of revolving door of obsolete technologies and, and where they all end up in these uh, incredibly toxic landfills. So in this world, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the kind of ingenuity and the resilience of these of these characters and, you know, how they managed to create these air infiltration masks, um, selling canisters of renewable energy, um, you know, this is a mobile hover, mobile aquaponic hover farm um, that, you know, travels throughout neighborhoods, providing produce, sustenance for the communities, um, public transportation, a kind of reimagining of the motorcycles called the Okada that we see um, uh, in, in Lagos, as well, of course, throughout, you know, the rest of Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, as well, the Tuk Tuk, which is the three uh, wheeled vehicle. So this is kind of this sci-fi hover, um, you know, double, double height, uh, you know, uh, multi-passenger, um, you know, informal kind of transportation. How, how, how students, uh, children are learning. So, um, you know, we have these group of kids, they're wearing these chest plates that are hard drives. Uh, where programs can be loaded into these hard drives and they're wearing these goggles that allow um, for AR augmented reality, right? So they can kind of go on class field trips through these particular goggles. 
Um, again, just kind of reimagining this world. We have um, this kid here on the left um, going around amplifying, um, you know, uh, 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 cell and Wi-Fi frequency. On the right is an amphibious um, uh, autoponic vertical farm trawler and, 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 and uh, you know, um, duplex housing unit. And so again, just really fascinated with, um, you know, combining these, these characters uh, with these elements of body modification of, you know, kind of inventive, you know, like this mobile water port here. Um, you know, these, in, you know, these kind of fascinating inventions. And so again, I'm, you know, here's how the images start. I kind of, you know, isolate the, 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 the elements of the image that I want to use as a foundation for creating these kind of very lo-fi black and white uh, halftone images. And so on the uh, left, you see it's a blend of, you know, the SketchUp model matched to, matched to the perspective of, you know, this truck and these hover elements added in, and of course the plantings and vegetation. And, you know, as, as part of, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated in how I'm showing work as an architect and how I'm showing work as an artist. And so, you know, as, as, as Mario mentioned, when reading through a little bit of my CV, I've shown in, you know, these pretty um, exciting and impressive spaces, but in keeping with the very um, hands-on, again, lo-fi nature of, of these particular images, much of how I'm showing these works is kind of refer returning them to this, you know, to the urban spaces and putting them on these various surfaces just as kind of form of, um, you know, slap up stickers and, and, and street arts that you see around a lot. So this is, <laughs> this is my ongoing um, exhibit of these works. It takes place often in my Brooklyn neighborhood on all these different, um, you know, urban infrastructures. Um, and so now it's moving into, you know, really uh, after Shanty Megastructures, you know, and interestingly enough, I was born in Lagos, but I left at six years. So I was born in Nigeria in, in, in Ibadan, lived in Ileife, um, the shirt that I'm wearing, Ileife, uh, up until I was around six, seven years old um, and hadn't returned to Lagos in, you know, 30 years at the time. And so people kept asking me, you know, like, when am I, you know, I've been such a long time resident of Brooklyn, New York, when am I going to kind of return and think through reimagining Brooklyn, New York? And so at the onset of the pandemic, um, I started this project called the Brooklyn Afro Eco, Eco Agro Futures. And so this is a little bit uh, into my process. I collect an enormous amount of 3D assets of photo, uh, real assets of characters. Um, uh, again, so much of the images that I create are much more rooted in collage um, than I think a lot of people may realize. And so here's an example of all of those kind of, um, again, 3D assets that I place into my work, but also tons of photographs I've collected and shot of, um, you know, bodega storefront. Because similar to Shanty Megastructures for Lagos, I was then fascinated with the everyday architecture, infrastructure, kind of urban landscape of places in New York, like Brooklyn, of the bodega, of the rooftops, and the conversation around air rights of the alleyways. So I started with taking these pictures. And so this is from my roof, um, you know, right here in my apartment, right upstairs. Um, and then building in, you know, again, these really dense sort of green worlds. And so this is called Bodega. Uh, Bodega Eco Haven. Um, so it started with that kind of photo montage from my roof, but then I constructed 3D models around it so you can get different views. Um, and again, this is on my roof looking back towards the stairwell. And so on the right, you see kind of the reimagining. It was a very hot summer. So, you know, just thinking what a fresh water marsh, you know, how refreshing, uh, you know, that would feel. So I'm just really creating these images. Um, and, and again, part of walking around Brooklyn and taking these photographs, you know, and, and building my world into it was um, inspired by the pandemic and us witnessing in real time the sort of uh, collapse or at least 
um, untenable nature of the infrastructures and the systems that are supposed to maintain uh, us, um, you know, as 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 citizens of of this country, you know, for everything from living wage to healthcare to adequate education, really seeing the failings of these systems. So imagining what it would look like, you know, beyond these systems and kind of building up this sort of world of our own. And so this is like this drone, this massive drone farm, um, uh, automated drone farm, you know, this occupying uh, this, uh, which is currently this kind of salvage yard a few blocks away from where I live. Um, but now you see it's kind of built up into this. Um, and then alleyways, the gaps between buildings um, were very fascinating, again, to me to build these scenes into. So you see this kind of bubble farm, microclimate for growing vegetation, um, you know, that probably we couldn't grow here. And then finally, I began looking at the MTA, the train system, which is going to lead into uh, the project that I presented at NOMA, uh, sorry, at the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, um, called the Frozen Neighborhoods. And so this is another view of my roof. Um, and this is a rain, uh, a fresh rainwater uh, kind of harvesting plant, also drone, you know, water uh, drone delivery service. And so as well, this kind of roof garden, with these, you know, pedals, uh, solar pedals that kind of open up, that power the building, um, and so you see these individuals kind of walking through this this roof garden. So what I presented for reconstructions, as Mario met, mentioned, which is an exhibit of twelve um, black architects, were invited to really reimagine cities and think through, um, you know, the, the, the notion of, 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 of analyzing and, and reimagining these kind of city spaces. Um, I selected Brooklyn and I, and I created this kind of um, precedent where, you know, the impact of global climate change became so uh, um, dire that the federal government passed a series of legislations to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions. One of them being the mobility credits, which effectively each individual community, household, family, what have you, is granted a finite uh, mobile credit that determines where they can go, where they can travel, how far they can travel, how often they can travel outside of their community. And I placed it within the kind of free market environment where mobility credits can be bought out. So if you're rich and you can buy more mobility credits, you buy them up and you can travel kind of as often as you want. And so um, on the other hand, poorer communities were selling much of theirs instead um, to produce, you know, to kind of produce enough capital to then create these worlds. Um, so within that uh, kind of framing, I imagine how that might look in Brooklyn. So the images you're seeing here was built up from a drone photograph that a friend of mine took uh, above his office building here looking out towards um, South Brooklyn and, and Manhattan, and then me bringing in this kind of wetland marsh and then developing again up uh, this kind of architectural and greening language and the idea of rewilding of the urban landscape um, and of kind of creating a holistic relationship between architecture and community and environments um, and individuals. So this was a, so this was a presentation and how it looked. Um, you know, a bit of this exhibit was truncated due to uh, the sort of parameters around COVID. Um, but I, again, my world building was, you know, I, I tend to kind of really go deep into the world. So I created tons of renderings, um, full scale uh, sculpture here of what a subway map would look like now, as well as these kind of three uh, abstracted sculptures that reflect different aspects of this world. Uh, I made maps, a seasonal occupancy map, looks at, you know, now areas of Brooklyn on the edge of the island um, for a, a certain part of the year are flooded. So what that does to the communities and how, you know, um, a lot of the stuff that's built, a lot of the infrastructure works around those realities. <clears throat> And again, similar as, as, I, as I started with that first image, when, when making a kind of key legend that really explains how this world works, I 
wanted to use the storefront language of the bodega just because of how um, important bodegas, storefront churches as institutions are to these communities. They're more than just stores, you know, they, they, they really are essential to um, how these communities thrive. So this is actually started with the photograph I took of a bodega right up the street. Then I placed in all these different posters and so much information around, you know, the different technologies in this world, the different maps, the flood zones, a heat map, um, farming map, um, the, the new subway map, um, which is kind of the second part of this conversation where, you know, now that the subway is no longer running, you know, I had community members and individuals kind of take over, um, you know, the subways and use them as now these spaces, these virtual spaces for travel, virtual travel, for social public engagement, for social public programming, for learning, for school, um, as, and, and, and as such, the, the substation. So this is the East New York substation code room. Um, much of the kind of nerve center of the technology of how the aquaponic systems work, how the seed systems and the plant and water systems work, and how you know the different programs and hardware for um, you know the, the the new MTA program. You know MTA uh, now it was, it was known as of course the Metropolitan Transit Authority, but now known in this world as Main Threshold Access. So this is an example of a code room where all of that is kind of being worked out um, and controlled remotely. And this is what this, the sort of new subway system looks like. Um, again, you know, a, a, a space for kind of this sort of global exchange, community exchange um, for social programming. And so again, I had, you know, made this gateway kiosk, I actually purchased, um, uh, a commercial slash residential mailbox. You see a lot of these um, all over the neighborhood in Brooklyn, either in front of kind of businesses or in front of residents. But the idea of repurposing, uh, you know, the kind of everyday urban infrastructure um, to create, you know, these, these new um, mapping and subway maps and technologies. And then these maps, uh, sorry, these kind of sculptures, like this shall be food for you. So another part, of my thinking through the frozen neighborhoods world was to make uh, all of the storefront churches, the multi-denomination churches, um, you know, from the synagogues to the masjid to, uh, you know, the Pentecostal church have united um, to become this kind of interfaith seed system responsible for the splicing and the developing and the preserving of, of seeds, of, of food seeds. Um, and of course the bodega, this is uh, the image on the right is 24 hour bodega barge. So, you know, in the seasonal occupancy neighborhoods and much of the main thoroughfares, thoroughfares and arteries uh, with, uh, throughout Brooklyn have now been flooded uh, either, you know, due to climate change or intentionally. So a lot of the main arteries like Nostrand Avenue, um, Washington Franklin Avenue are now these fresh water, um, you know, thoroughfares. And so this is on the back of my installation. Um, you see a series of these images. And so he, here are the images kind of close up. The one on the left is Plant Seeds Grow Blessings, Brooklyn Interfaith Seed Vault. So an example of, and it, these started with images that I've taken throughout my neighborhood that I've built up. Um, you can't even see the, <laughs> the initial architecture, but this is a warehouse uh, on the corner of Klassen um, and Pacific. And so, but it's now been overtaken as this kind of uh, farmer's market uh, seed exchange um, with these gondolas that, you know, cable cars that connect to other seed vaults and other buildings. Um, and on the right is what would be kind of like the university now, um, the East New York Greater Gateway, where there's a series of subway cars um, stacked on each other with signage out front showing the kind of programming religious services, social services, travel services um, that occur there. And then another example, as I mentioned, of the wetland thoroughfare, of the wetland thoroughfare this is the Crown Pro wetland intersection 
um, showing, you know, all the kind of activities taking space around this waterway, um, both for leisure, for fishing, uh, for religion, um, you know, baptizing um, on the perimeter. There are, you know, the kind of floating bodegas, um, these detachable bridges. Um, and on the right, showing you um, the Franklin Avenue shuttle gateway triple stack. So what a smaller version of the East New York gateway would look like um, in a kind of smaller community area. Um, I think that is time. I will open it up for, uh, I guess, conversation um, and, and questions. I like, uh, right, that was really uh, fantastic. Um, we will open it up uh, for questions. And uh, if those of you in the audience have questions uh, for like, if you would put those in the, in the Q&A, that would be great. Um, but like, I'd just like to maybe have a, a brief conversation before we, we do that. I, um, as you were presenting, and again, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of, of a fanboy uh, of the work. So, um, but I, I want to go back to uh, uh, the beginning of your presentation, um, uh, particularly with the Akira Jones drawings. And you mentioned that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, for many people, um, they had not really seen this kind of work before. And um, that it presented a different kind of aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps this isn't so much of a question, but it also seems to me that, that maybe that also revealed the kind of ignorance of, of, of the global North about the global South. Um, Absolutely. That, uh, you know, many places on the continent, you know, also, for example, you know, places in India, you know, cell phone penetration was much deeper or is much Absolutely. deeper than it was in, in Europe or the, or the US, you know, you know, mm -hmm. in the you know in the early 2000s um, and I recall that you know some of the early work that my colleague Mabel Wilson and I were, were doing research in uh, in Johannesburg for example you know, mm -hmm. you know discovering that you know in some parts of Soweto for example people had more you know two or three cell phones <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> and that for you know and and even in some of the let's say uh, sort of uh, what I guess, uh, you know, used to be referred to as informal settlements like Cliptown and Johannesburg and Soweto. Um, I think, you know, just about every dwelling had a cell, uh, had, had a, uh, a satellite dish uh, yeah. and a flat screen. And so, and, uh, but that gets me to the point that how technology, you know, you know, for, you know, places on the continent, Lego, jo Lagos, Johannesburg, wasn't about luxury, but it was actually about necessity. Absolutely, um, that people used mobile phones to, you know, to pay, uh, to pay the, you know, electric bills or to sort of get certain kinds of credits. And so, you know, in a way, it seems to me that um, that this work is really, yes, it's you know, futurist, but it's not futurist because, you know, uh, the the global South has been using technology. <laughs> And adept at using technology in creative ways, you know, mm -hmm. for a very, very long time. You know, Absolutely. and maybe it, maybe it's the global north is just kind of now catching up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's, you know, it's interesting that you mention the kind of mobile uh, uh, you know, penetration in, in these in these markets in, in Africa and the Middle East, because that's part of why I kind of named um, you know, shanty megastructures is, is, is actually a play on SMS, you know, on, on the SMS technology and, and chat, mm -hmm. as, as, as well, chat um, is, is the governing ideology of the shanty megastructures. Of course, chat and chat rooms and such, um, it stands for the chaotic anarcho-technocracy. I as well was incredibly fascinated with the amount of kind of uh, uh, ingenuity that's, that, 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 that was able to be, um, uh, you know, produced just off of, you know, very early flip phones even, you know. Uh, I, I as well was in a um, uh, settlement in, in Cape Town back in 2005, you know what I mean? And, and, and they had, I remember visiting this home, like this dude who made beats for everybody, right? And he had, like, it connected through these multiple phones, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> certain programs then connected to, like, a computer and flat screen. And just, yeah, I mean, you, you, you see 
an enormous amount of inventive uh, uh, um, uh, use of these items that we use here and kind of, you know, almost their direct use way to surf or do whatever. Um, that also inspired the anarcho knots, you know? So, you know, the, the, the kind of imagery around the anarcho knots is very much about repurposing, recycling, upcycling, finding new uses for these particular technologies to really speak to the fact that, um, you know, this aspect of being present, you know, not even necessarily just futuristic, is so much a part of life of, of, of these communities and spaces and also entrenching a sci-fi-ness and aesthetic deeply into culture. So much of the Western interpretation is both to suppress fashion, to suppress style, right? So much of, of what we see and particularly the kind of cinematic reimagining of sci-fi is that, you know, in this new world, we all dress the same, we all wear the same clothing, we all have to speak the same in order to kind of um, uh, uh, manage either our emotions or, or, or suppress us from engaging in wars or overspending or all these different things, right? There hasn't been a lot of imagery that's deeply steeped in, in everyday life and kind of cultural traditions uh, yeah, that just yeah. exist, right, in, in these spaces. Yeah, yeah, and I, I guess maybe that now that brings me to maybe this is a, is a question, <laughs> and this is a question about uh, I guess the word Afrofuturism, because I know that you said you know you accept it, you you don't mind it, it's serviceable. Um, so I want to ask you know serviceable to whom, and uh, I'm also wondering, is it? Um, uh, no, are we at a point where perhaps that that word is no longer necessary? Um, I mean, it, it really kind of dawned on me uh, uh, when our you know, mutual friend Empo Metsipa I think yeah. said to me, and and uh, it was March or April of 2020. Um, you know, at the beginning of well, the beginning of the pandemic in in New York, she said, "Mario, this is just the beginning of the movie." <laughs> and you know, she also said that, you know, the, or, or implied that the kind of precarity that we were all kind of sensing um, mm -hmm. was a kind of precarity that places in the global south and on the continent sort of deal with every day. Absolutely. Um, and then the other part of that, that that really got me thinking is how much we really do now live in a kind of black mirror, Mr. Robot matrix uh, kind of kind of world that maybe the, you know, the West is you know, has thought of as being kind of sci-fi, but it was always kind of present in, in certain societies. So I wonder, getting back to this question, I mean, who is that phrase serviceable mm -hmm. to? And, and can we get rid of, you know, can we eliminate Afrofuturism as a, as, a kind of, uh, as a kind of word to describe certain kinds of work, perhaps the work that you're doing, the work that, of, of others? Mm. Absolutely, I think we can, <laughs> right? The short answer is yes, I think we can. And, and, and I briefly want to touch on, you know, you're, you're um, you know, uh, speaking to Paul saying, this is just the beginning of the movie and, and, and the parody we're experiencing here has been felt in the global South, but it's also been felt here as part of our history, you know, the history of blackness in America. And that's one of the things that really had me beginning to think through whether this work is future, you know, is 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 futuristic, or, or or whether it's drawing on the tradition, right? So if you think of being brought to the Americas, to the Caribbean as as slaves, as enslaved people from West Africa, every single thing we created <laughs> under those conditions, leading into the modern age, was a sci-fi radically new invention. You know what I mean? The food. Yeah the music, right? Like yeah. we, everything we made, we had to make new. There was not even a, on the scale of the transatlantic slave trade, there was not even a, 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 a precedent anywhere else in human history <laughs> for what we did in the Americas and in the Caribbean and everything we created from food, infrastructure, family life, to music, to what have you. 
it was all new. And of yeah. course it drew on traditions as, as it does, right? So, you know, that's why things by Afro surrealism became kind of maybe more relevant or just interesting. I started adding it in as well because it says that we have been facing, it's, it says that we've been creating incredible sci-fi works because of, 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 of this history, because of these parameters imposed on us, um, as well as when we talk about all the, you know, so you talk about the precarity in the global South and, and now of course that we're facing here, seeing the crumbling or, or the failure or the, or the exposing of the failure of the infrastructure, um, that dystopian, you know, nothing was more dystopian than being an enslaved, uh, you know, man, woman or child in the Americas. It doesn't get as dystopian that. So all the stories that, you know, so many people love, The Handmaid's Tale, right? You know, how frightening that scenario is of The Handmaid's Tale, right? I mean, being a Black woman, having a child, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. All of yeah. that was happening yeah. that, you know, so the dystopian future has been visited upon us and we've, and, and, and we've already been creating within that. And I think, you know, Afrofuturism worked um, maybe like, you know, around when this came out, 2013, right? And, and, and I think now it's more of a kind of marketing uh, a keyword or, or, or strategy or a way of placing certain works into a genre, but it's it's no longer adequate. And I said serviceable just because I'm not one to um, really put an enormous amount of my own particular effort into, you know, another question you asked is who is it for, right? So I simultaneously don't care sometimes how it's labeled. I don't care, right? <laughs> because <laughs> I think my work is 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 for you know, the, the audience that identifies with it and, and, and that sees it. And if, you know, certain venues, you know, want to categorize it as such, it's, it's low hanging fruit. It's not that imaginative. Um, I think we're now creating much more language to discuss these works. Uh, Afro Afrofuturism is becoming way too broad. You know, uh, this would be called, you know, according, you know, with, you know, um, you know, uh, the writer, uh, you know, Nnedi Okorafor is, is his, his, you know, works really hard to continue to remind people that her work is African futurism, right? It's, it's very much rooted in, in cosmological beliefs of, you know, the Igbo, the Yoruba and culture and society and, and real lived experiences, right? So, you know, we're, we're now really getting beyond using these generic terms. Yeah, that, um, I mean, we're, we're about to go really deep here, but <laughs> <laughs> this, um, it, it reminds me of actually a couple of quotes by, you know, Toni Morrison when asked about, you know, who her audience says, and she says, I write for black people. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you know, that's, you know, I, she's not, she wasn't writing to be a universal writer. Yeah, so, exactly, you know, exactly. You know, Mm -hmm. All right, we, yeah, we're about to go deep here, but maybe I should, you know, I'll stop and see what questions that we have, uh, that we have in the chat. Um, so, uh, I mean, here's a, I think the first question is coming from uh, Andrew Thompson. Um, how close does your ideology relate to what was portrayed in uh, Neil Blomkamp's uh, District 9? That stage was set in uh, Johannesburg actually in, in, in Soweto. I mean, I'm sure mm -hmm. we all know District 9. I mean, it was really kind of, uh, uh, well, Peter Jackson, I think, uh, directed it. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to say anything about, you know, about your work in relationship to that or not. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting because District 9 was incredibly divisive <laughs> among Africans, specifically Nigerians. I remember getting into a lot of conversations and arguments yes. because of the way Nigerians were presented in District 9 as pimps, savages, criminals and such. Um, so, I mean, that's a whole other conversation. You talk about yes. getting deep. Yes. That really got into a lot of the issues of xenophobia within South Africa. It was very, um, it, was, it, was, it was a very kind of controversial movie in, in regard to that portrayal. 
but it did have that kind of, again, aesthetic that was very much grounded in um, kind of local culture, local infrastructure, building type, like, you know, it was, it, it was a sci-fi, um, you know, narrative that, that I think was, you know, an early one rooted outside of kind of the Western context. So in that regard, you know, my work, I don't know the ideology per se, right, but at least the tradition or the, the new tradition now of placing sci-fi um, work, imagery, visual, music, art, culture, fashion within outside of a Western context. It's definitely aligns with, I think, what District 9 did visually, even though it was deeply problematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I won't even use the, you know, I, they were, there was a, a P word that was used for them, which became kind of pejorative, I think, in terms yes. of... Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, maybe here's a uh, here's a question from Mohammed uh, Ismali. Uh, can you speak on the role of the architect in these imagined futures, where the built is replaced by the assembled, the ad hoc, and the repurposed? That's an interesting question, and it's something I kind of face as someone who works within the realm of speculative architecture. Um, and I, you know, I've, I, I've, I've faced kind of criticism, confrontation, pushback around these works, particularly when they look dystopian. And I, I say this a lot, that architecture in the kind of public imagination and a lot of how we learn it in schools is about solutions. You know what I mean? And, and the power of architecture um, and design to solve or address a variety of you know um, social, political, environmental issues, and on one hand, the work can do that in certain instances, but it it, it must be supported by the systems and infrastructures. And in other instances, practicing as a traditional architecture um, and produce you know producing in in in, in kind of very uh, precarious neighborhoods and communities where there may not be the um, kind of infrastructure to support long-term, the architectural, the well-meaning architectural works, um, you see the difficulty in what architecturally, architecture as it's traditionally practiced and the built can do. Um, that said, I think supplanting, supporting in addition to that work, I think that's where speculative architecture can be very useful and very important. Um, allegorical, uh, satire, inspiring or, you know, what have you. And, and, and I think, you know, there is that, there is a lot of room within the role of the architect to explore within the speculative world and realm and, and this kind of architecture, particularly for not being bound to, you know, those infrastructures or to gravity and, and real time, real lived space. You know, there's so much exploration and, and kind of inventive um, you know, nests can occur within within that kind of work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it also seems to me that I mean, the your your work is also expanding the scale of thinking about architecture from you know from the scale of the body mm -hmm. uh, to the kind of urban scale, um, and in a way in which the you know the architectural object, the building becomes less precious. And, mm -hmm. you know, which is probably the thing that got, has gotten us into the trouble that we're in now. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, you know, so I think I, I find the work kind of fascinating in terms of the way that you're able to kind of cross these scales um, and, mm -hmm. yeah, and mm -hmm. move across these different scales. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you're right. That's, that's, that's a lot of kind of what has gotten us into trouble. You know, the Western tradition of architecture has been, has long had a kind of imperial or colonizing or you know the kind of legacy of that now is 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 building with permanence right and so uh, a lot of architecture and a lot of the ideology of architecture here is is kind of um permanence long lasting and often dominion over nature as opposed to working within you know like you said in, in my works the buildings sometimes disappear there's a rewilding right or right like or disappear behind the vegetation and the kind of regrowth of you know um, the, the the flora and fauna that that existed before you know anything was built. 
Um, maybe along those lines, uh, may uh, Abu Salah ask, uh, could you talk about the role of the state, if it exists, in the imagining of these uh, utopias and how that differs between Lagos and Brooklyn, for example, or in the base assumption uh, always that these utopias are brought about via a grassroots bottom-up movement? Yeah, um, the state figures kind of heavily in defining the response of these communities, right? How it looks. And so that for me is where the question of are these images, these speculative worlds that I'm creating, are they dystopian or are they utopian? And similar to as I was discussing with kind of the trajectory of, of enslaved and free Black folks, the condition is dystopian, but a lot of the creativity and genuity is possibly uh, a utopian. And so the relationship of the state is to show these very repressive, uh, antagonizing infrastructures and regimes, right? And in, in, in the frozen neighborhoods, it is uh, the mobility credits. And, you know, as we know, there's kind of a history of marginalized community often facing the brunt of these greening measures, right? Um, and, and really, you know, experiencing much of that through a sort of environmental racism, right, even in corrective strategies. So the role in that is that I'm, I'm kind of responding to the conditions that the state has set, right? And then, and then within those very specific restrictions and repressive regimes and systems, what we're able to create and produce out of that. Um, and in Shanty Megastructures, it was about the kind of massive large scale development that, that takes place, right? And so uh, 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 as part of how that occurs in, in Lagos is, is of course um, all of the kind of private foreign investments, right? That, that, that really takes precedence in a lot of the infrastructure that gets built. And, and that, you know, um, very little is, is directed or, or thinking through where um, you know, much poorer communities may live. Something like 70, I think 65, 70% of the population in Lagos lives in informal settlements, lives in these slum settlements, right? So there the state is the actor that kind of create, right? That, that, that I'm, I'm responding against how development practices occur in, in Lagos and, and presenting not necessarily an alternative, but a vision that says, hey, these communities exist, here they are in the future, now pushing back, overtaking, you know, these, these spaces and being, uh, you know, hyper, hyper visible. Yeah, I mean, actually, I mean, this gets me thinking back uh, perhaps to the, to the previous question a bit, um, you know, and the way that we uh, think about these spaces in terms of, you know, in the design studio, in terms of architectural pedagogy, because it's often uh, you know, the underserved communities, you know, you know, becomes a, a neighborhood that we're working on in the design studio yeah. as a kind of experiment for, you know, for greening the, the neighborhood or let's mm -hmm. do this strategy in, in, in Harlem, mm -hmm. let's do this in, you know, in, in Crown Heights or let's do that mm -hmm. in what have you. Um, whereas, I mean, I, I think one could say well, it, 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 it's all of that new condo construction going up in Tribeca, which is also cool. contributing to the, you know, to the degradation of the climate, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, wealthy yeah. neighborhood. But yet, you know, we want to go to, um, to the exactly. undervalued neighborhoods and, and, and experiment with our, you know, our green solution, so to speak. No, that's actually a, a really incredible, fascinating point that I had, had never, I, I may have kind of skirted around it, but hadn't forefronted, but you're right. Yeah, like, you know, we, again, and that's part of the kind of paternalistic patronizing, you know, the, the, the well-meaning, you know, studios, of course, that, that occur, right? But, but I also say we need to be aware of, um, you know, our presumptions about what we actually can do. And you're right about what the problem is. We're going into Crown Heights and, and, and Harlem and in West Oakland and, you know, doing all these exercises, but you're right. <laughs> the kind of development that takes place in Hudson Yards with the shed and all the, you know, that contributes an enormous amount. And, and, and you know, a, a you know, multi-million dollar project like that 
you know, isn't, isn't, you know, there's, there's not exercises about going into those communities, right? Uh, you know, how are we going to, you know, reduce the footprint in the Hudson Yards or reduce the footprint in the Upper West Side or redistribute the shade wealth that they have there? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and that's an incredibly, yeah, I, I think that's an incredibly silly point. Like, why are we not thinking of challenging these other communities? And that then becomes, again, the danger of that very, um, paternalistic way of, of you know, of, of thinking about architecture, like we're going to come in and do good in this community, right? Rather than challenging the, the places that are producing a lot of, you know, the carbon emissions and massive footprints and what have you. All right, great. Um, here's, uh, actually, we have a series of questions from Will Cowell. Um, would you be able to talk further about the processes uh, you develop for creating your work? Um, that's part one. <laughs> part two is, do the image and text world building co-evolve with one another or does one lead the other? Um, and the third is, do you have methods for acquiring the assets employed within your photo collages? And is there, or are there periods of acquisition or flirtation with these icons and images before the narrative is fully uh, formed. Um, yeah, if I can kind of remember the processes, um, I think I, 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 I may sort of start in, in the middle. Uh, and I believe you asked about the textual, meaning the language, right? As yeah, well as the yeah. architecture. Yeah, there's a kind of dance that, 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 that occurs between that. And I continue to evolve the language as I revisit these images, right? So, you know, new Legos precedes shanty megastructures precedes, um, you know, uh, African mobilities precedes uh, anarcho knots, you know, and I'm always working through and again, you know, back to the first one, even adverse speak in the public private partnership program, language was very important. Um, they, they, they kind of evolve and they shift back and forth as we think through whether terms like Afrofuturism are relevant or appropriate or clarifying enough um, as I get feedback on, on, on the work, right? As I think through what aspects are utopian or dystopian, or as I present them in different venues, whether I'm showing it in an art space, in an exhibition space, or whether I'm presenting it here at a, in a, you know, in a lecture at an architecture school, I'm very fascinated about how I'm speaking about this work, right? Um, and so that's part of the collage too, even what I decide to name these images, you know what I mean? Go, go forth often before, you know, right, the work itself or, or again, clarifies what the work might be about, you know? Um, and and it, in addition, same thing with kind of the assets. Now, in, in regard to them, you know, I've, I've used things like Quixel Bridge or Sketchfab or it, a lot of people don't know that I actually do the majority of building up these spaces and, and, and modeling the computer elements um, using SketchUp and pri primarily because SketchUp has access to the 3D warehouse. So I can bring in all of these assets very, very quickly, you know, and particularly for the 3D warehouse and SketchUp, um, they're all, you know, free creative license in any commercial and private or personal, you know, sense once you've, you know, signed, signed in and, and, and logged on, you know, others might require um, getting rights, but I, I, I don't face much of that because I go particularly to like workplaces <clears throat> and venues that, you know, have free sort of creative use and, and license. Um, and, and so much of the remixes and, and the remixing of the imagery comes back and forth between looking at the assets and thinking about how I want um, to develop the narrative within, you know, like the narrative within the images. You see a lot of my images are very visually dense. There's a lot of information from, again, the kind of architecture or the vegetation or the scale figures or a lot of the signage, or again, the kind of 3D assets that you find in there and how they're telling um, the story and how I'm really remixing them. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, that, well, <laughs> among all of the things that I appreciate, one of this is kind of the saturation that, mm -hmm. um, that uh, 
yes, it's a you know two dimensional image, but it does. There, there seems to be there's a kind of real atmosphere mm -hmm. that one can kind of sense. Uh, you know, as if the you know there's this kind of depth to the to the screen or even to the to the image when we're seeing it in a in a gallery that yeah that seems to not just be about the, the visual but also mm -hmm. somehow about being an embodied space also having this kind of sensory conditions one can begin to imagine what the um uh what the fragrances might be of the you know the mm -hmm. plants mm -hmm. or you know or of the you know uh or of the wetland on top of the roof or, 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 or yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> no exactly and 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 i do a lot of that because I'm interested in once I've created it and I have my own narrative and there's a broad way I frame it, but really, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so much more interested then once it's out of my hands in the interpretation of the image, you know, and all of the things that people say, yeah, is that being right? And a kind of that it might elicit a kind of possible olfactory or haptic sense, even though it's this still image, I, I kind of, I'm thinking, in that regard of that richness of it, you know, which is why I'm, I, I want to further develop the work into more kind of virtual spaces where you can experience it as well with, with you know, possible touch or sound or, you know, begin to really draw even more on the senses to pull you into these spaces. Yeah. Um, let's see, maybe one last question here, I'll circle back to uh, Andrew Thompson um, and, no, maybe I'll just kind of preface this question. Uh, I know that you, uh, you know, in let's say discussing the role of of the, of the architect, which was I think um, uh, one of the earlier questions. You know, talked mm -hmm. about you know we're you know taught to come up with solutions, and so I think this question uh, maybe sort of uh, is along those lines. And that is, do you see your ideas as one of the solutions, for example, to uh, to housing? Uh, for example, or or to other uh, conditions in the uh, in the U.S. That's a great question, and and no, I wouldn't see it as solutions. Um, and I and and I really love that question because it's part of why there's been so much pushback um, that people may not know about the kind of you know about these kind of works that I've produced, right? Or 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 the desire to categorize it as the utopian or dystopian, right? or good or bad, I think we need to move out of the binary. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> solutions or not solutions or a detriment or not. I think there's so much more room that, you know, we don't, I, I think we need to be thinking of, of all the tools available, right? Um, the language available, the, 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 you know, validity of criticism of satire, of humor, of, you know, um, there is that sense of like capital A architecture, um, capital A activism, you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in terms of, we, we think of activists as this kind of um, uh, 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 almost like a, a sort of Spartan practice, what you give up, what you're willing to give up, what you do, how you fight or present, right? But, but you know, art, music, you know, play, whatever, joy, all of that is, is, is part of it as well, you know? And, and I think if we can like, I think if we can, you know, show this holistic view, right? Around how we can think about issues. So, you know, the housing issue, this could be inspiring. It could be an, uh, 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 what's it like a cautionary tale, right? Um, it could highlight certain things, um, but but I think it is useful, right? So I, I, I will say that I think the, 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 the work that I do is useful in either contributing to a particular kind of discourse or questioning, you know, certain things. Um, and again, we have, you know, we, 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 we have a culture of placing value in that in which we can quantify immediately, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, how many people are you housing? How many, you know, how is it whatever? 
But we know there's so much more that goes into all of this, all of this world making, all of culture, all of the traditions that we exist within, that we have that shape what our life looks like, right? And it, 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 the prime example is you saying, you know, so many, uh, <laughs> you know, so many studios focus on going into these marginalized neighborhoods and don't go into, you know, what can be remade or unmade in these, you know, privileged or luxury neighborhoods, you know, or, or, you know, upscale or, you know, neighborhoods as well, right? And so by being so polarizing around solutions or not solutions, I think it creates a, a huge blind spot in, in what we and how much we can really think through and how much we can really expand and expound on a particular problem or issue, right? Great. Well, I know that you just landed back in New York, uh, JFK, uh, earlier today. <laughs> so we won't keep you too much longer. Um, Next time, hopefully, we'll be able to, to do this in person and then uh, continue the, the conversation, uh, you know, over a dinner or, you know, or with a small gathering. But thank you so much for, you know, for a fantastic presentation. I know this is really just, you know, a snippet of your body of work, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really fantastic. Um, and thank you so much for sharing this with our, with our students and everyone else who was watching tonight. Absolutely. No, thank you very much for having me. And as well, it's always great to be in conversation with you. It's, it's been a while. So I, I really appreciate the kind of thoughtful going deep way you, you know, you, 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 you frame and make this conversation, I think, um, in, incredibly worthwhile and, and, and inspiring. And so thank you for that. And of course, uh, thank you. It's, it's weird being in Zoom. You know, you don't know who's out there, but to whoever's out there, and to the people who pose those very thoughtful questions, thank you for uh, coming out tonight. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Uh, good night, and uh, please, uh, you know, attend our next lecture uh, coming up. And uh, have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>